We good? All right. Cool. Well, good morning, everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's another action packed Sunday. Um, I'm ready to share something with everyone that I pray will bless you. Because, um, you know, we, we've gotten to the point where a very we, we have become very us versus them. Whoever us is and whoever them is. And I want to take our example, our model, back to he who saved us. Okay? Because it, here's the thing. I, I'm, I'm at this point in my life. Where if I don't see it modeled in Jesus, I don't want any part of it. Honestly. And, and, and that's the point of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is so that we can see how things are modeled in Jesus. Well, let me go ahead and, and pray, and then we're going to get started with the lesson today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you because you're a good daddy. We thank you because you care for us, because you love us, because you provide for us, because you protect us. We thank you that our walk is not about what we can do for you because you're God and you don't need anything from us, but it's all about what you've done for us. And so for that, we praise you because you've done all things for us already in advance. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Real simple. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm really glad, too, because this, um, I really believe that when we preach, when we teach, when we witness, whatever it is that we do, that we do it with boldness, simplicity, and power. In other words, we should not be bashful about what we believe. We should not be bashful about what we say. We should not be complicated about what we say because if and, and periodically I go back to my kids and I take I take a pulse with them and I ask them did, did they understand what I said because if they don't understand it then that means I've missed it so with boldness simplicity and last but not least power Somebody should experience something. I mean, when you walk into a room and open your mouth and begin to speak, that the atmosphere around you should change. Something should happen. Somebody should say, man, did somebody raise the temperature in here? Whoa, is, that, is somebody wearing a new perfume? I mean, there should be something that, that changes the spiritual atmosphere to the point where it's, where it's manifested physically. Amen. So today I want to talk about being a friend to sinners. Being a friend to sinners. Because a lot of people, I mean, we, we've seen in the last few weeks, you know, we've had some celebrity suicides. And, and then on top of that, uh, thousands more who were not celebrities that took their own lives and people come to the point where they take their own lives because they have no hope I mean it, it, and, and listen let me tell you something that hope deferred is hope denied if you tell somebody well you know it's all going to be okay in the sweet by and by what you've just done is you've given this person a license to discharge everything. Because why should I wait until I get to heaven to get relief from my pain? It, you know, there, there, are people, there are people who find joy in suffering. And it's not God's will for us to suffer. It's just not. And, and, and the point that I'm getting at with all of this is that Jesus was called a friend to sinners. 
He was called a friend to sinners. They said, because, and I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself because this is in, in the scripture, but because he hung out with prostitutes, because he hung out with drunkards, because he hung out with tax collectors, people said, man, this Jesus, he's supposed to be some kind of priest, but he's hanging out with all the dregs of society. Do you know that by extending yourself to people who are cast away by society that when you speak to them that when you spend time with them that when you pour into them that when you eat with them that when you embrace them and hug them and tell them that it's okay do you realize that you're giving them some hope that they probably did not have in other words at that point, you are ministering Jesus to them. I, I wish, oh my God. It, you know, this, this is just something that really is stirring in my spirit because we Christians have this belief that we are to separate ourselves. Separate yourself from the world. Separate yourself from the drunkards. Separate yourself from the druggies. Separate yourself. Separate, separate, separate. And, and listen, you will not change anything by separating yourself from the thing. At some point, you must engage. You must engage. But anyway, let me let me go to the scripture for the day because um, listen, if, if we got to see this in context, because what Jesus did is a trait we should emulate. We should emulate this. I mean, this is something that we should be doing to magnify Christ in our bodies. Okay, and it, it ain't it ain't like <laughs> it ain't like trying to. Live a holy life that's magnifying Christ. No, 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 no. It's loving. It's loving. And, and, and if we're not if we're not doing this, we're not effectively preaching the gospel. So if you have your Bibles, if you turn to Luke chapter 7, verses 33 and 34. Luke chapter 7, verses 33 and 34. And it says, for John the Baptist has come neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and yet you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, behold, a man who is a glutton and a wine drinker, a friend of tax collectors and notorious sinners. Before I go further, I want you to understand two things. We need to level set, get some definitions, some working definitions here so that we know what, how to unpack this text, okay? And it's this, number one, what is a friend? What is a friend? What does it mean to be a friend? You know, now if you look at Merriam-Webster, uh, uh, Merriam-Webster defines friend as one who is attached to another by affection or esteem or one that is not hostile. That's a friend. That's the dictionary definition of a friend. And if you go to, to Strong, uh, Strong's Concordance, which is where a lot of us theologians go to understand things, Strong says basically the same thing. Okay, without going into a lot of detail, it says basically the same thing. So now we understand what a friend is, and, and, and I'm going to get a little bit deeper into this. So we need to also understand what a sinner is, because if we're going to be a friend to a sinner, we need to understand what a sinner is, right? So here's Merriam-Webster again. It defines sinner as one who sins or a reprobate. One who sins or a reprobate. And guess what? Strong says basically the same thing. You know, it, it's, it's funny how, you know, word definitions between the dictionary and the concordance, you know, a lot of times they, they actually kind of line up. It's a funny thing. So, so, so watch this. Uh, 
First of all, if you are in Christ, you're not a sinner. Let's level set right there. If you are in Christ, it says that in him there is no sin. That's uh, 1 John 3 and 5. In him there is no sin. So if, you, if there is no sin in him, but he says abide in me, then that means that there can be no sin in you because there's no sin in him. That, that, that alone is like when you connect those two dots, that alone makes religious people blow a fuse. I mean, I can, I can hear circuit breakers breaking in the spirit right now. So, so that's, that's the first thing. The, the second thing is that you're a new creature. You're a new creature in Christ. You're something that never existed before. You know, I, I, imagine this. Like, I like to think of myself, man. I'm like, I'm, I'm like, a, uh, I'm like a purple giraffe unicorn <laughs> with tiger stripes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I am. With a lion's mane. That's what I am. I'm, I'm something that never existed before. And, and that, I've been recreated in the image of him who saved me, again, who had no sin. So if I'm recreated according to that paradigm, then that means I must be recreated without any sin. Now, some people will say, well, preacher, are you telling people that they just don't sin anymore? Listen, as long as you're walking around in this meat bag, this meat bag likes to do stuff. This meat bag likes the way things taste. It likes the way things t uh, smell. It likes the way things feel. It likes stuff. And this meat bag is sometimes going to try to assert itself over your spirit, man. But see, that's why what, what we do is when we, when, we re, when we transform our minds, when we renew our minds, we get our soul lined up with our born-again spirit, and because I understand how fights work, normally numbers prevail. So if I got my soul and my spirit working against my flesh, I got numbers. Numbers usually work out. I tell my kids all the time that, listen, pay attention to the numbers because normally the numbers don't fail. Now there's always room for a statistical anomaly, but that's another subject for another time. But the thing is, I want to get my, born, my, my soul, which is my mind, my will, my intellect, and my emotions lined up with my born-again spirit. So now we got numbers. And I can keep the flesh kind of under control. Now, they say, okay, people say, well, we're just sinners saved by grace. No, you're not a sinner at all. Because once you are in Christ, you are like Christ and you are Christ-like. <laughs> and and there, in him there is no sin. So you're no longer a sinner, you're a saint. Watch this. If I happen, to, and I am a software engineer by profession, that is my, my occupation. But every now and then, I like to make something out of wood. Every now and then. That don't make me a carpenter. Tim here builds engines. If he goes and, 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 and puts some plumbing in a building, you know, to try to help out a friend, that don't make him a plumber. In other words, your who you are and what you are is not determined by your behavior. It's determined by your spiritual position. And your spiritual per, uh, your your spiritual position will always prevail above any condition. So, now that we know what a friend and a sinner is, I got a question to ask you. Are you a friend? I mean, before, before we talk about becoming a friend to sinners, let's talk about, are you a friend? 
See, because people think that when, when you're a friend, in order to be a friend, you have to be friendly. And there are people that say to me, you know, well, Derek, I don't understand why I don't have any friends. But you're talking to me, right? <laughs> you got at least one. <laughs> but the, the, the point that I'm getting at here is, if you want to be a, if you want to be, be befriended, you have to be friendly. And, and being, fr being friendly or being friend-like or being a friend has absolutely nothing to do with being polite or courteous. It has nothing to do with really, you know, he's a nice guy or she's a nice girl. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with do you understand what it is to be befriended? See, here's the thing. If you want to be befriended, you have to be a friend. And in order to be a friend, you have to love. I don't care who you are. You know, like if you say, well, I'm, I, that, that's my friend, but I can't stand him. <laughs> that, that, you know, that's cognitive dissonance. I, I, you know, it doesn't make any sense. If you, if, if you are my friend, I love you. And love is not just some polite euphemism for some emotional content. That, no, that's not it. Love is empathy and compassion. In other words, I have empathy. I, I want to see things through your eyes. And I deeply care about what you're going through. Through. So if I'm going to be a friend, I have to love, and love means I have to have empathy and compassion. If I don't have empathy and compassion, there, there listen, there is no love. If, if you don't, if you, <laughs> let me say something here. Everybody knows about the rich man and Lazarus, right? Everybody knows about the rich man and Lazarus. That, that the rich man fared sumptuously. He ate well. He wore good clothes. He lived in a good house. But every day he walked over this beggar named Lazarus. Every day he walked over him. And it said that they both died and the rich man opened his eyes in hell. Now, when he says hell, first of all, <laughs> he's saying Gehenna, which Gehenna was the trash dump outside of Jerusalem, not the underworld, the home of eternal conscious torment. That was not it. And this story has absolutely nothing to do with eternal conscious torment or whether or not there is a, an, a, a place where you go for eternal punishment. That is not the story. You got to look at it in its entire context, which it said there was a rich man who fared sumptuously. He had it going on. He had the best clothes. He had the best place to live. But every day he's walked right over this beggar. In other words, this man had no empathy or compassion. And because of that, it's because he was a rich man, see, in, 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 in that day, if you were if you were to die, if you had wealth, you'd wake up. In, I mean, if you were to wake up after death, you'd wake up in your tomb, a nice, comfortable place hewn out in the side of the earth for you. But it said he woke up in Gehenna. He woke up in the trash dump. And not because he was, it didn't say that this man was a sinner. It didn't say this man was a drunkard. It didn't say this man was a whoremonger. It didn't say this man was a thief. It didn't say that he was a liar. It didn't say any of those things. It just said that simply that he walked over Lazarus regularly. In other words, what Jesus was saying is that if you lack empathy and compassion, you truly don't know what love is. That's the moral of that story. I just had to go there. That was off the script completely. But I just had to put it out there because every, you know, when, when you talk about hell, that's the people who love to cling to hell as a doctrine, that's one of the first places that they go. 
Luke chapter 16. But let me keep going here. You cannot love anyone without first being loved. Because you have to have some paradigm for what love is. See, the thing is, you can't love anybody unless you love yourself. And you can't truly love yourself unless you understand what it is to be loved. That's why it's important for us to understand that God loves us. Man, listen, God loves all of humanity. Not just the suchy much, not just the churchgoers, not just the ones who sing spiritual songs, and not just the ones that go to church every Sunday, and not the ones that get up to pray every day at 5 a.m. Listen, all of that's good, but none of that is a determining factor. God loves everyone. And once you understand that, see, this is why in preaching the gospel, the essential part is telling people how deeply loved they are. Because then once you understand how deeply loved you are, then you can say, okay, I know that I'm loved, so now I can share this with others. I have something that I can cling to, something that I understand, something that I can relate to, and I can pass this on to others. So now that we know what the definition of a sinner is, we have to say, okay, so who can judge sin? <laughs> See, this is where the rubber meets the road, y'all. <clears throat> because people say, well, you got to call out sin. You got to tell people that they're doing wrong. No, you don't. You don't have to tell somebody when they're doing wrong. Now you might have to tell a child that because a child is still kind of learning. They're still growing. They, they really haven't completely grasped the sense of right and wrong. But grown-ups, adults, I don't have to tell you when you're doing wrong. You know. If it's wrong, you know. And if it's not wrong, you know. So that ain't my business. That's between you and God. I ain't got no skin in that game. None whatsoever. So, so the thing is, is that I, it is not up to me to tell you that you are a you are a sinner and you're going to hell. That ain't what I that, that's not what I'm called to do. Not what you're called to do. It's like this whole thing about. Saints versus sinners is an us versus them mentality. And, and, and the reality is, is that God created us all, put us all here in this earth. And so we're all in this thing together. God put us here. And, and, and basically God said, you know something, y'all? Y'all got to work this out. I gave y'all dominion. Y'all got to, People say, oh, well, human beings just ain't going to get along until Jesus comes back. Y'all, that's a bunch of nonsense. That's straight up foolishness and it's straight up fatalism and it's straight up doctrinal nonsense because Jesus ain't going to just come and supernaturally straighten things out when God gave us dominion. He told us to have authority in the earth. So if we have authority, it's up to us to change it. It's like all of the things that go on in this world, whether it be racism, sexism, classism, political differences, God has said in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, he says, sort it out. Sort it out. This is on y'all, not me. So for everybody that thinks that God is just going to come and supernaturally, you know, wait when, when the rapture comes, and, oh God, God is going to just sort all of this out. He's going to put his sheep on one side and his goats on the other. No. It's not how it works, boys and girls. It ain't happening. You know, it, it's like this is what Jesus was talking about in Luke chapter 6 about the, the moat and the beam, you know, the, the speck and the beam, you know, that you're looking for a speck in somebody else's eye when you got a big log sticking out of yours. And the reality is, for most of us, that a sinner 
It's just somebody who sins differently than we do. See, if my sin happens to be, I drink a little. But you cuss. Well, you know, all I do is drink. It don't hurt nobody but me. But you cussing and that offends everybody. That you, you, you start, see, what, what you start doing is you come up with a sin scale. You know, in other words, this is bad. This is a little worse. This is a little worse. And oh, and this is an abomination. <laughs> All right, so, so let's go here. I want to I get to this. How did Jesus deal with sinners? The woman at the well in Luke chapter 4, I mean John chapter 4. She had been married five times. And, 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 and here's the thing. The old covenant taught that divorce was a sin. Unless you divorce for anything but adultery. So here she had been divorced five times and she's shacking up with a man. Oh, she's shacking. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, if you if you go into a church nowadays and say I'm 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 living with my with my boyfriend, then you <laughs> get drunk. Uh, uh, if you up there at the testimony mic, they're gonna sit you down <laughs> because you just said you shack it. Oh, we can't have that. But watch this. Jesus didn't say anything about the shacking. He didn't say you need to get it right or get left behind. He said. I want you to go into Samaria and preach this gospel. In other words, God took a woman in the midst of her sin and sent her, ordained her, <laughs> ordained her and sent her. <laughs> Y'all with me? Oh, but, but I ain't done yet. The woman caught in the act of adultery. She was worthy of a death sentence. They asked Jesus, they said, what should we do? What, this is what the law says. What do you say? And Jesus just started sitting there scribbling in the dirt until everybody was gone. Because he said, he who was without sin cast the first stone. In other words, she's a sinner, but what are you? What are you? And then when, she, when he sent her away, he said, he said, go and sin no more. But I'm going to say something real quick here. Because when, when he said, go and sin no more, he wasn't telling her, like, yeah, you better not go out and do this again. That's not what he said. He said, you're going away sinless. You're going away clean. You're going away forgiven. You're going away restored. That's what he said. But I ain't done yet. <laughs> Zacchaeus, the tax collector, in Luke chapter 19, y'all got to understand about tax collectors. See, we, we, we think, you know, tax collectors, why is it so, why did people make such a big deal out of tax collectors? Why was that such a big deal? Because the tax collectors in the Roman days, these were Jewish people who were hired to do Rome's dirty work. In other words, if you didn't pay your taxes, they sent the tax collector to come and visit you. Y'all know what that meant? That usually meant that you were going to be deprived of your kneecaps. <laughs> this, this was not going to be a pleasant experience. See, I, I used to always say, you know, you know, Jesus, most of his, most of his posse, his, his, uh, his 12, they were all, you know, they were mostly thugs and, and sailors, right? Except Matthew. Because Matthew was a tax collector. He was the educated one. No. No, Matthew was a tax collector. Matthew was a loan shark. That, that's the deal. So, so here, Jesus had, had a bunch of uh, 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 two-fisted, uh, cussing, drinking, uh, kneecap-busting thugs as his twelve. Not one Pharisee in the bunch. Not one Sadducee in the bunch. Not one lawyer in the bunch. None of them. And watch this. John chapter 2. Again, we talk about how Jesus dealt with sinners. Because like when, with Zacchaeus, he told Zacchaeus, look, 
you know, Zacchaeus went, was, was trying to confess to him. He was, because Zacchaeus was, well, everything that I took from, from people, I gave it back. I did everything. Jesus stopped him and said, hey, man, listen, hold your confession. Today, salvation has come to your house. That's how Jesus dealt with sinners. But watch this. John chapter, two, John chapter 2. Jesus' first recorded miracle. He turned water into wine. I love this one. Because it's like, well, the religious people say he turned it into grape juice. Because he couldn't have turned it into wine. That would, that would just be encouraging people to sin. Do y'all know the grape juice? First of all, I'm going to give you a little bit of history lesson. Y'all know about Welch's grape juice, Welch's grape jelly? Do you know that this guy, Thomas Welch, is the guy that invented the process to make grape juice without it fermenting? And do you know why he did it? Because he was a good Baptist. And people were like, oh my God, we can't, we can't. People are getting drunk at communion. So he came up with a solution for that. To deal with people's religious sensibilities, he came up with a process to turn wine or, or, or what, would, what would normally turn into wine into grape juice so it wouldn't ferment. So in other words, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, members of the jury, I humbly submit to you that grape juice did not exist back then. It had been wine from the get-go. Going all the way back to Noah. When Noah got off the ark, what'd he do? <laughs> Noah turned up. He got drunk. And two of his kids covered him up and one of them exposed him. But there was wine. And Deuteronomy chapter 14, it says that if you, your distance between the temple and where you are be too far to bring your tithe, Again, this is agriculture, not money, by the way. Uh, then, then exchange your tithe for money so that when you get to the temple, you can buy whatever your soul lusteth after. I'm saying this is what the scripture says. I'm not making this up. Whether it be food, drink, or strong drink. People that are teaching tithe, they ain't teaching that. They ain't, they ain't teaching that you should take your tithe and go and get your booze on it. They ain't teaching that. But that's what the scripture says. I'm not making it up. That's what it says. So watch this. Jesus turns this water into wine at a party where everybody was already drunk. And, and you, if you're going to look in, in John chapter 2 verse 10 and you see that it says when they were all, when all the men were well drunk and I went and looked at that in the concordance and it said intoxicated, inebriated, drunk. In other words, Jesus turned water into wine and not just wine, turned it into good wine because it, it normally when the, when the party goers got drunk, then the master of the feast would start bringing out the rot gut because everybody was too drunk to know the difference. But Jesus brought out the good stuff at a party where everybody was already drunk. If you want to know how Jesus dealt with sinners. I mean, and listen, if, if there was a good time for Jesus to deal with people about their behavior, Jesus could have said, you know something, when his mother came and said, you know, look, look we, we're running out of wine, Jesus. You know, Jesus could have said, you know what, y'all dirty, rotten, low down, drinking, uh, you know, drunken so-and-sos, y'all need to turn and repent. If there was a good time to do that, that would have been there, right there. Jesus had an opportunity to, to but, but watch this, at no point, at no point, anywhere, it says Jesus hung out with, with prostitutes and wine bibbers, and he was called a glutton, which meant that he ate too much. All of these things that Jesus was called, you're not going to get called anything unless you're hanging out with the people that do that kind of stuff. And all in all of these cases, there is nothing, I mean absolutely nothing. I mean, I've searched the scriptures backward and forward and there is nothing where he called these people out. 
But he did call out the religious leaders. He did call out the church leaders or the synagogue leaders. He called them out. He called out the religious folk. He called out the self-righteous. He called out the such and much. He said, you generation of vipers, you whitewashed tombs, you hypocrites. Not the people, see, the, the people who, who religion calls out today, oh, you're, you're a drunkard, you're a drug user, you're a homosexual, you're a whoremonger, you're a pimp, you're this, you're that. And those are the people that religion today calls out. And you say, but Jesus was a friend of sinners. But you can't be. Who in the hell do you think you are? Yep, I said it just like that. So watch this. So here Jesus goes into the temple and he cleans out the temple. They say, oh, well, you know, Jesus dealt, that's how, you want to know how Jesus dealt with sinners? He went in and braided a, a whip and he went in and chased everybody out of the temple. No, you know, he changed out the money changers. He changed out the money changers. He, changed, he, he ran out people who the religious people permitted to be in there to take advantage of the saints. That's who Jesus was clearing out. Jesus never dealt with anybody because of their behavior. Never once. When, whenever there was a behavioral issue, Jesus imposed his righteousness upon the situation. Oh boy, I got to get through this. So watch this. Jesus dealt with sin over 2,000 years ago. Sin has been dealt with. There, there is, there, sin is no longer an issue with God. Because, and people say, well, you, you, are you trying to say that all, you know, all of your sins, past, present, or future, were, were dealt with at the cross? Well, absolutely, that's exactly what I'm saying. Because by a show of hands, how many people were alive at the time of the crucifixion? Anybody? By a show of hands, how many people were alive at the time of the crucifixion? I'm almost that old, but... How many? None. So obviously your, your future sins had to have been dealt with at that cross, right? So watch this. Everybody has a propensity <clears throat> to sin in their flesh because of the flesh bag. Flesh likes stuff. Flesh likes to eat stuff, drink stuff, touch stuff, smell stuff, taste stuff. That's, that's what flesh likes, right? But in terms of our spirits, our born-again spirits are perfected in Christ. And John chapter 1, verses 29 and 1 John 2 and 2, it says that Jesus took away the sins of the world. Not the sins of them who believe. The sins of the world. The sins of the world. Of the world. That means everybody. You know, <laughs> Everybody, he, he took care of those sins. So watch this. In God's sight, that means there is no longer a class of people called sinners. Which brings me to my closing point. How do you become a friend to sinners? By simply recognizing that there are no sinners, that there are just people. Be a friend to people. Because the, here, here's the deal. That between sinner and saint in a scriptural context is those who are conscious of Christ and have appropriated the benefits that he's given us and those who choose to remain in darkness. That's the difference. But that, all it is is just a matter of consciousness. It's a matter of what you think. See, that's why you have to renew your mind. That's why repentance means renewing your mind, changing your mind. So, so God has already dealt with the sin issue. So there's no class of sinners anymore. There is no more us versus them. We're all in this together. And just like for God so loved the world, we should so love the world just like God gave Jesus for us we should be sharing Jesus with everybody it shouldn't be a thing that well if you get it that's great you get your ticket to heaven punch 
But if you don't, you're going to hell. Stop that. Stop it once and for all. Please stop it. Because that's not the gospel. I'm going to tell you something. The word gospel literally means too good to be true news. It's not just good news. Good news is like, you know, I go to the bank and I, and I to the ATM and I take out $20. I got $20 to take out. That's good news. But if I go to my ATM and I put my, my card in and, and it says I have a balance of $20 million, that's too good to be true. I know I didn't work for it. I know I didn't deserve it. I didn't steal it. I didn't win it in the lottery. Nobody will. It, it just showed up. That's too good to be true. And that's what the gospel is. It's something that showed up on your behalf that you, did, you could never earn, you didn't deserve, you couldn't work for it, you couldn't win it, you, you couldn't inherit it, but there it is. So if you want to be a friend to sinners, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends of all ages, be a friend. Period. Full stop. I pray that somebody heard something today that blesses them, that will help them walk in the liberty of God's unconditional love and unlimited grace. I, I, and, and, and for those who know Jesus, who are Christ conscious, I hope that it helps you walk in a further understanding of that liberty. I just, I, you know, listen, if you want to be a friend, if you want to befriend it, be befriended, be a friend. Be friendly to someone. Be loving to someone. Be kind to someone. Show empathy to someone. Show compassion to someone. And you will change the world. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you that has gone forth with boldness, simplicity, and power. Thank you that has ministered grace to our hearing. And Lord, thank you that has filled us up and supercharged us in such a way that we just want to go out and share this too good to be true news with others. That they may be blessed and understand that they are blessed as we understand it. And we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. God loves you, and so do we. Stay blessed.